In the last video, I configured OSPF version 2 on routers R1 and R2. And now in this video, we need to configure OSPF version 2 on router R3. We have the instructions here. We're on step 5, R3. And these are the things that we're going to need to add to this OSPF routing process. And you can see it's listed right here, all of the things we need to do. So I'm going to open up R3, and I'm going to begin to do them. type enable to get to privileged user mode and then conf t to get to global config mode and then router ospf and then process id of one and now we've activated ospf let's set the router id right away to 3.3.3.3 and now we need to begin adding the networks that we want to advertise now we need to add our connected networks so the networks that are connected to r3 are the 192.168.5.4 network here on the serial link, and then the VLANs that we have set up on sub-interfaces on gigabit 0 slash 1 here. That's the 192.168.15 network, the 25, the 35, the 88, and the 98 are all on this link. Now, this gigabit 0 slash 0 is an IPv6 network up here, so we're not going to advertise that with OSPF version 2, which is an IPv4 routing protocol, we're going to need to use OSPF version 3 for IPv6 to advertise this IPv6 network, and we'll do that later. So right now, just OSPF version 2, and we're going to advertise our connected networks, the network connected here on the serial interface, and the networks that are connected to our gigabit 0 slash 1 interface, which are actually sub-interfaces. So, and you can see them right here, R3, and then all of the um, sub-interfaces that we have there. Okay, so let's do that. So we'll start with our sub-interfaces. So we'll say network 192.168.15.0, and then the wildcard bits, which is the inverse of a subnet mask. So if the subnet mask was 255.255.255.0, it's going to be the opposite of that, and that'll be 0 .0 0.0.0.255. And then the area, it's area 0. All right, and there's our first network that we're advertising. And the second network is the 25 network. And then the 35 network. And the 88 network. And the 98 network. Now, all those networks are attached to sub interfaces coming off of gigabit 0 slash 1. So now I'm going to also add the serial link. So on the serial interface, the serial interface is a little bit different. It's the 192.168.5.4 network. It's been subnetted, and then the wildcard bits for that are 0.0.0.3. And why is that? Because the network is a slash 30 network, meaning 255.255.255.252, and the inverse of that is 0.0.0.3, and that's also area 0. And you'll notice after we do that, and you can see after we put in that 5.4 subnet that we got a message from the router that we have an OSPF adjacency change. And it looks like we have um, established a neighbor relationship or a neighbor adjacency with router R2. So as soon as we started advertising and sending OSPF messages, out of our serial interface, we we're able to set up a neighbor relationship with R2. Now, how come that didn't happen when we added the networks here on our gigabit 0 slash 1 interface? Well, the reason it didn't happen as soon as we started advertising OSPF messages out of here is that we configured R1 to have a passive interface out of the gigabit 0 slash 0 interface. So it's not sending OSPF messages on this link. So no OSPF messages are traveling across these trunks over to R3. Now the way, that's because that's what I uh, basically asked everyone to do. I asked everyone to set up a passive interface on the LAN interfaces. Now looking back at that right now, I'm not so sure that that was a good idea because the reason we use a passive interface command is to not send OSPF messages into a LAN where there's no other routers. If there's no other OSPF routers on the LAN, then you're basically wasting bandwidth, and it's also a security risk to be sending OSPF messages about the nature of your links or networks or routes um, out to people on the LAN. 
But in this case, we have these LANs, right? These, these networks here are all interconnected with these trunk links across switches. So there actually is another router going out of this interface. In other words, if we send OSPF messages along these trunks, it will reach router R1. So I'm not so sure that setting up passive interfaces was a good idea for these LAN interfaces here. Um, I'm going to leave it for now because it's part of this packet tracer activity and it's something you're also going to see on your CCNA finals and your lab finals is setting up those passive interface commands. So we'll just leave it for now and, and not worry about it. Um, and if it's a problem, we can always change it later. So um, I think it could be a problem because the whole idea of it is that if a link goes down, let's say this link was to go down, then R1 can respond bond by communicating that to R3 and they learn that there's another link going this way. But if R3 and R1 are not communicating on this interface, then there's no messages going across that link there. So um, that could isolate R1 from the OSPF basically area zero and um, not communicate effectively essentially um, and not communicate routing information to the other routers effectively. Okay, so, but it's part of the lab, so we need to do it anyway. So we're going to do it right now. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, passive interface, tap passive interface, and we're going to set it up on gigabit zero slash, I believe it is one in this case. Yes, gigabit zero slash one dot 15 and 25 and 35 and 88 and 98. Now, once again, I don't think that's in the best interest, but it is part of this lab, so we're going to do it. We also need to set up passive interfaces on our loopback interfaces. So LO0, LO1, LO2, and LO3. Now, that's part of the instructions is to do that. Now, we also need to advertise these loopback networks that we have coming off of R3 right here. Loopback 0 is 172.16.4. 172.16.5, 6, and 7. So this is 172.16.7.0 network, and the router is dot one slash 24. So we need to advertise all of these networks, but we need to do it in a summary route. In other words, that is the instructions here. Except use a single summary route for the loopback networks. So that's what we're going to do. And I'll show you how I'm going to do that. I'll say network. 172.16.4.0, but for the wildcard bits, I'm going to change it to 0 .0 0.0.3.255 area 0. So you might be asking, well, why? how did I come up with this wildcard bits, and, and what is the significance of this? What this is going to do is, is this is going to summarize the 4, 5, 6, and 7 networks in just one network statement in my OSPF um, in my OSPF routing process. Now, how did I come up with that? Well, pretty easily. If we have a 172.16.4 network and I put the subnet mask, if I wanted to create a summary route, if I wanted to create a summary route that summarized the 4, the 5, the 6, and the 7, then I would use a subnet mask like this. And why would I use a subnet mask like this? Because the last bar of bit is in the 4's place and then I call that the magic number four, and that's going to summarize a four subnet all the way up to the next subnet, which would be the eight subnet. So effectively, it would summarize four, five, six, and seven, because the next subnet, if you use this type of subnet mask, would be 172.16.8.0. So then you take this subnet mask, right, 255.255.252.0, you invert it in binary, and then you get 0.0.3.255. So it's a subnetting issue, and um, and then that's that's what I came up with. That would effectively summarize those four networks in one statement. Now, according to these instructions, I should probably also put a passive interface on gigabit zero slash zero which goes to this IPv6 network out here because I don't need to send OSPF version 2 messages out of this interface. But I know for a fact that I actually forgot to do this when I set up this packet tracer activity, so I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to leave it as is. Now you can if you want to, but I don't believe it's necessary because the, um, the packet tracer uh, skills activity here is not going to grade you down if you don't have it. So. 
Now what we want to do, now that we have all of our configurations for OSPF working on um, this router, we'll take a quick look at it. So we'll say control C, we'll save our configuration and we'll take a look and you can see there's our configurations and what I'm going to do is I'm now going to go in and I'm going to type clear IP OSPF PR tab process clear IP OSPF process and I'll hit type yes and I'm going to clear all the processes for OSPF on this router and then I'll go to R2 and I'm going to do the same clear IP OSPF process just kind of flush the process and get it to basically restart and now that everything is completely configured related to OSPF version 2 clear IP OSPF process and yes so you can see these adjacency changes when uh, the neighbor goes down when it's forced to reset OSPF immediately posts a message saying hey we lost our OSPF neighbor router that we've been exchanging information with so alright I'm pretty happy with that and I'll save my configuration one more time and now it's time to set up OSPF version 3 for IPv6 between R2 and R3.